Uh, and uh, I'm supposed to summarize 45 years of collaboration, which is absolutely impossible in only 20 minutes. I need about 20 hours, but we'll see how, go how this goes and I'll try to stay uh, on time. So this is Fred uh, when I met him in 1971 or 1972. Can you identify him on this picture? This is the whole biophysics department of the Weizmann Institute. There's Fred, right there. He hasn't changed much, it's really quite a mar remarkable. And I, I think I'll attribute that, uh, the mustache is white now. I'll attribute that to Anita and his wonderful family who kept him young. And this character right here, that's me right in back of him. Always supporting him, always in back of him. And there's some famous people here, Mayor Vilchik, Natan Sharon, and so forth and so on. It was an incredible department, incredible atmosphere. So Fred was in the department working with uh, Tzvi Bohak uh, on making analogs for an enzyme, beta-lactosidase, and I was growing yeast, working with, the, with Mayor Vilchik, and we said, you know, has anybody ever looked at peptide uptake in yeast? Uh, before I tell that story, I must say that Fred came to the White Institute after his doctorate at, with Murray Goodman at Brooklyn Poly. So Freddie is a, uh, is a New York boy, born and bred. Uh, he did his undergraduate degree at Cornell where he received a master's, bachelor's in engineering, I believe chemical engineering. And then he came back to Brooklyn to work with Murray Goodman. There'll be a lot more about Murray in this symposium. It's with Murray that Freddie formed collaboration with Michael Horev and Ken Jacobson, who were speakers later on in the symposium. So Freddie and I were both working for a fry and And uh, in 73, after Freddie and I had left the Weitzman, I went back to Tennessee. Freddie went here to College of Staten Island. Ephraim became president of the State of Israel. And we sort of joke whether we drove him out of science into the presidency or maybe, I don't know, I think maybe he knew that he could never get a better student than Freddie Nader, so he decided he should be president. So Ephraim was president of Israel for five years, and during that time, of course, he hosted Anwar Shadad, a very historic meeting. Uh, I have many stories to tell about Freddie and I and Ephraim, but again, it's too short, and maybe during the break or tonight sometime, we'll tell some stories about our interaction with Ephraim. It was an incredible experience for us. Uh, it, it was an uh, experience that helped us grow as scientists and as individuals in many ways. So Freddie and I started working together on peptide uptake in, in yeast, and we had to get materials for this because no one had available the particular peptides we wanted. Uh, and uh, I obtained a mutant of yeast that grew on methionine, required methionine, and so that required us to have methionyl peptides. So Petty ma uh, Freddie made a series of, of peptides, uh, gly, gly, met, met, gly, met, all different uh, permutations of uh, trimers of methionine and glycine. And this is the method he used, the old-fashioned peptide chemist, because Freddie was trained as a peptide chemist. There's not many people that can do this kind of chemistry anymore. Freddie was a master at it. And we were going around the world, say, uh, around the lab, and I'd say, Freddie, where's the met, met, met? Well, I have met, gly, gly. Well, how about met gly met? How about gly met met? How about gly gly gly? It was really hilarious. We all we knew what we were talking about, but I don't think anybody else did. So anyway, this was our first indication that yeast can grow on peptides. Not all peptides. Some of them didn't grow on very well. And this was the start of a wonderful collaboration that lasted 20, 25 years on the uptake of peptide transport in yeast. And at the end of uh, many years, with many analogs and many different. Uh, yeast strains, we sort of had a, this black box where peptides were taken up into the cell through a transport system of some kind. We didn't know what it was, both dipeptides and tripeptides. This was interesting because it was coupled to the influx of protons. It was a real typical transport system, but that's about all we knew about it until the world of cloning came in. And this is Freddie and I in 1978 in front of uh, the Walter Science Building in Tennessee. Again, Freddie hasn't changed very much, and I haven't really changed much either, have I? Yeah, well, actually, I've changed a lot more than Freddie has. But we've been maintaining our collaborations, and then around this time, we also thought about working with uh, peptide in a pathogenic yeast called Canada albicans. It's still a very important pathogen, uh, and what we tried to do with Canada albicans is design a peptide that would 
take up a drug and kill the organism as part of drug design. And in order to do that, we had to understand the requirements, the structural requirements of the peptide transporter and where we could hook on drugs. So we knew that this, this end had to be free, this end could be used as attachment, and Freddie's expertise in peptide chemistry allowed us to synthesize a number of derivatives of peptides to be used for peptide transport and to smuggle in a drug. And this was the concept. This concept had also been put forward by uh, Bruce Ames and Charles Gilvarg, and they called it illicit transport or peptide smuggling. The idea is for the carrier to be a peptide, for the peptide to have a drug hook onto it, that carrier peptide, that uh, peptide drug uh, uh, combination would get into the yeast, this represents the yeast strain, where the toxic moiety would be released and kill the yeast, but that carrier would not penetrate into human tissues, and the drug itself wouldn't penetrate into the, into the yeast or the human tissues. So this was illicit transport, also called smuggling, and we actually had some success with this and were funded for many years, but we never actually brought a drug to target, but it was a wonderful collaboration, and we felt like we contributed to the peptide transport as a drug carrier, and in fact, there are a number of peptide drug carriers today using human medicine, some for uh, antiviral drugs, but not so much for, for fungi. Well, what happened was molecular biology came to peptide transport, and that really opened up a tremendous area for our research team. And uh, in 1994, we were the first to clone uh, and isolate a gene uh, and encoded a peptide transporter for yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This was the first eukaryotic transporter cloned. And you're going to hear more about some of this from Mark Lubkowitz today who carried forth some of the uh, peptide transport system in our lab. Uh, and we found actually after a number of years, and we cloned some of these ourselves, that peptide transporters exist throughout the living world. They exist in plants, and Mark is going to tell more about this. We were the first lab to clone the peptide transporter of, of the plant. And when I say we, I mean my lab and Fred's lab, because this is all about our collaborations that has, gone, that has uh, gone forward over the 40 years. Peptide transporters have been cloned in mammalian cells, including humans, and in humans are being used for drug delivery, in insects, and of course in the fungi and yeast that we were the first. So we've, we contributed to uh, peptide transporters in the fungi and plants, and Mark is gonna tell you a little bit more about the plant world and the peptide transporters there. Well, we started out with a black box that we didn't know anything about. We cloned the peptide transporter. We characterized the transporter. And now it turns out that in this study that we did with uh, two of our students, Hu Jin Kai and Sarah Kaufman are not here, we found that the peptide transport, as many other systems, requires a whole systems biology approach to really understand it. And in fact, uh, this is what we think of peptide transport today. This is the transporter up here. And all the rest of this stuff in the cell is required for the peptide transporter to do its work and to be regulated. So the peptides are taken into the cell, they're cleaved, the amino acids are released. There's all kinds of regulation occurring at the genome level in order to turn on and turn off the peptide transporter synthesis. The, the peptide transporter is degraded and recycled. So this makes, a lot, makes for a lot of fun. And uh, this is, uh, this is really where we are today with peptide transport, trying to understand the full regulatory system of the peptide transporters. Well, about 1980-something, uh, well, so I want to, I want to uh, talk uh, to attribute the, recognize those people that worked on the peptide transporter. Mark Lubkowitz is going to talk today about that. Robert Baffey will be talking about uh, Fred's contribution and uh, what he did for his career at the banquet tonight. And there's many, many names here, many, many people in my lab and Fred's lab. The one, the virtual lab, this virtual lab that spanned from New York to Tennessee, which was quite a remarkable way to do, to do collaboration. So around 1980s, late 80s, it was recognized that the yeast talked to each other through different sexual mating factors the alpha factor, which is this 13-amino acid peptide, and the A factor, which is this 
molecule. And Guy Caldwell this morning will be talking about our work with the A factor, so I'm going to leave that to, to Guy. It turns out that this system then is a model for how peptide hormones in humans and other, or, other organisms act on a cell to introduce a signal for the cell to do stuff. So this is, a, this is sterile 2, ST2. This is the, 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 uh, the receptor for this peptide. And when this was published, Freddie and I sort of said, well, you know, this is just a larger peptide. Let's get into this work. Let's, let's make analogs and see how they, what their biological activity is. So again, it was Fred's acumen and ability to make peptide analogs and our work in the biology to look at the interaction of this molecule with this receptor. And this receptor uh, is, this is the, a diagram of the receptor. It's a large protein of 431 amino acids. It spans a membrane seven times. Ken Jacobson will be talking today about this class of molecules that are called G protein coupled receptors. And I'll leave it to Ken to talk all about this because there's not enough time now. But I just want to say that these are seven, they have spanned the membrane seven times. They're very difficult to work with. They couple to G proteins. There's about 800 different ones in the human genome, so they do a lot of different things. There's hundreds of different ligands or molecules, peptide hormones and other molecules like adenosine that, that Ken is going to talk about. And the crystal structure was determined and led to the Nobel Prize in 2012. And these are very important for human medicine because it turns out about 40% of all drugs in human medicine target G protein coupled receptors. So we thought that this G protein coupled receptor in yeast was a really nice model because it was so tractable to genetic manipulation and protein peptide biochemistry and synthesis that it could be studied in a very simple, simplified way. M many of you in this audience, I'm sure, take some of these drugs. They all target a G-protein couple receptor in the human body. So uh, also this afternoon, Jakob uh, 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 Oliver Zerbe will be talking about studies on the sterile 2 protein, this protein, uh, work done on the structural biology, which is mostly collaboration with Fred's lab. So this, is, this slide uh, uh, boils down the work of about uh, 70 people, maybe, on one slide, our understanding of how this peptide hormone receptor works. This is the, this is the uh, alpha factor here. We believe that the N terminus, the alpha factor, uh, interacts with this part of the receptor, that the carboxyl terminus interacts with this part of the receptor, that the peptide hormone binds here, and then the hormone maybe forms a hairpin, and the end terminus then provides a signal transduction system. So this is, we, this is the, uh, basically sort of boiling down in a very simplified way the work of 25 years and about 70 different people, something like that, what you say, Fred? But uh, this, it, it, took, it took an army to understand how this thing worked, and we think this is a really nice model for how other peptide hormones might work in the human body as well. This is the list of people who've worked on the pe peptide hormone sterile 2 project. Many of you are in the audience, and Leah Cohen will be talking a little bit about this today. Oliver Zerbe will talk, be talking about the uh, structural biology. Mark Dumont will be talking about sterile 2 and the uh, interaction he's had with Fred and I. And then Guy Caldwell will be talking about the A factor and all these other people, and many of these other people have not been in our labs, but have been, have formed, uh, have, have collaborated with us over the years. Ray Stevenson from the Scripps Institute, Jerry Thor Jeremy Thorner from University of California, Berkeley, Richard Epan e from, uh, from Canada, and on and on and on and on. Let's see, the number of people in the lab, are they're here now, Michael Talon's here. Uh, Shambhaka Murthy should be on here. Anyway, there you are. Find your name. It's been an incredible journey. So in addition to our collaboration with Peptide Transport and the G protein coupled receptor, Freddie has had other meaningful collaboration, one with Jakob Anglister on HIV that Jakob will be talking about, with Michael Horeb, published a paper with Freddie on substance P. Michael Horeb will be talking about his work. 
Bruce Stark, who worked with Freddie on fungal cell walls, will be talking later. Uh, and then these are some of the other collaborations Freddie has had through the years. It's really quite remarkable. So this is Freddie and I in Ephraim in 2006. It was a symposium for Ephraim's 90th birthday, and so we came back and gave talks at that time. I don't know what happened to Fred had an anti-mustache uh, <laughs> episode at that time. This is uh, Freddie and I and our wives, Nancy and Anita. Uh, we attended a peptide meeting in Hungary, I think it was, and uh, this was, uh, we were on tour in Prague. It's been my pl pri privilege and pleasure to be not only a collaborator, but really more importantly, a friend, a colleague, a brother to Fred Nader. So let me just tell you a little bit about what I learned from Freddie. One was to find wonderful mentors, and we've had wonderful mentors. Freddie's had Mary Goodman and Ephraim Katsir and many other mentors throughout the years. We've acquired many great collaborations. I think the secret to this has been using synthetic chemistry to study biological problems, bring these two worlds together, which has been really a wonderful way to do science. To know and love your system, I think you have to love your system. To build a team, and one thing I didn't put up here and, and all the accolades, I want to recognize that, you know, you don't always win. And uh, I know that Fred and I have had our failures. We've had many papers rejected and grants not funded. But the ability to fight back when that happens, I think separates the successful scientist from the unsuccessful one. So not fight back in anger or fight back in retribution, but to find the means to good, make the good argument or to do the good experiment to rebut the criticisms. And so Freddie and I have always had that ability, and especially Fred, and I think Fred has really goaded me on this. I tend to sort of get angry, and Freddie says, calm down, let's, let's face this, let's do this right, let's think of how to get up off your feet. And I always think of the quote of Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan, the great basketball player who said, I've taken 26 shots in my career for the winning goal. I've missed most of them, but what made me great, I was got, got up off the floor and I took the next one. So one thing about Fred is his ability to get off off the ground and to fight back. And I think that's, he, he gives that to his students as well, this ability to, to get up, face it directly, and to honestly answer the question. So here's Freddie Nader. And here's the important, most important person in his life, Anita. And these are just some of the qualities that I feel what, that makes Freddie a, a terrific person and scientist. His integrity, his intensity, his intelligence, his insight, his respect for others, no matter how tough he is, he always respects others, and people respect him for being honest and straightforward. And then perhaps his greatest accomplishment <laughs> is right here. And there's Avi is in the audience. <laughs> Alana is here. Rachel is here. And Shoshana, these are the four daughters. Three daughters and one son. Avi will be talking at the banquet tonight. And these are all the grandkids, all dressed in uh, Anita's wonderful <laughs> duplicate. <laughs> outfits. Uh, so I want to just say thank you to Fred for being my friend.